Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to the podcast and today I'm going to give my review of AEW's Dynamite. Starting off the evening we we'll go to our first match of the night. It is Roosh versus MJF. This is MJF's first match back since he's been out with injury. Um, I thought it was a great match man. It was a great way to start Dynamite last night. It was a back and forth matchup between Roosh and MJF with Roosh and MJF both exchanging in the middle of the ring. Roosh though was keeping the pace throughout the match. MJF then hits a hammerlock DDT on Roosh in the middle of the ring. MJF then hits a pile driver on Roosh for a near fall. Roosh then responds with a pile driver of his own on MJF. Roosh then hits MJF with a power cord on the outside of the ring. Referee was distracted. Roosh then throws MJF off the apron. MJF then gets up, hits a heat seeker on Roosh. And then MJF ultimately hits a brain buster on Roosh in the middle of the ring. Pins him for the three. And your winner of the match is MJF. After the match, Brian Cage and the Gates of Agony were shown on the Titantron. And Brian, Cage's, Brian Cage announces MJF's match at Forbidden Door, and it will be MJF taking on Hechicero at the Forbidden Door. A couple of things I want to talk about, man, with this matchup and the announcement of MJF's opponent, man. Let's start with the match. Number one, this was a great match. This was a, a top match, a great way to start Dynamite last night. And to be honest with you, I like the direction of where Dynamite was going last night, which I will get into towards the end of the podcast. But this Roosh and MJF match was a solid matchup. To be honest with you, I didn't think there was going to be a finish in this matchup. I thought there was going to be some kind of interference or something like that because Roosh has been coming in strong, and I didn't want to see. I, you know, I couldn't see Roosh taking the L, nor could I see uh, MJF taking the L. This was the first match that he was going to have officially back with AEW since he's been out with injury. But we got a clean finish with MJF becoming victorious in this matchup. Now, the other thing about this matchup was the ending. Brian Cage in the Gates of Agony on the Titan Tron, and Brian Cage announces MJF's opponent for Forbidden Door, which is Hechincero. Uh, this kind of took me by surprise, man. I think it kind of took a lot of people by surprise, to be honest with you. I'm not taking anything away from Hechicero. I think Hechicero is a great wrestler. He's a great luchador, and he's doing, doing great things in AEW as well as his career that he has over in CMLL. What shocked me was the fact that Hechicero was working with Brian Cage in the Gates of Agony. Now, I don't know how long this partnership's going to work between Hechicero and and Brian Cage in the Gates of Agony, but it's definitely intriguing. Uh, but that being said, was I completely shocked by this? Not entirely. And the reason why is because there's not a lot of matches, as far as I'm concerned, that have CMML superstars a part of the Forbidden Door. Uh, right now, I think there's two, with the announcement of, obviously, MJF versus Hechicero and the announcement of Mercedes Monet versus Stephanie Vacure for the... Uh, title for uh, title versus title matchup at Forbidden Door. That's two matches that have CMML superstars a part of the Forbidden Door. So it was bound to happen. I was just a little surprised by the fact that it was Hechicero versus MJF, and maybe not Mystico or uh, you know any other you know blue store that they have over there. I thought Mystico. To be honest with you, I mean I'm not saying that Mystico might not be a part of the Forbidden Door. He might be booked with another match at that date. Who knows? But Hopefully we do get Mystico a part of the Forbidden Door pay-per-view because I think he's a great luchador and he's, you know, one of the top draws over there in CMML. So hopefully, you know, we get him a part of the Forbidden Door. But um, as far as the matchup between MJF and Hechicero, that Forbidden Door, I'm not against it. I, I'm really not. I think Hechicero is really coming into his own. Uh, he's kind of a, I would say, luchador slash grappling wrestler. His submissions are insane and his move set's insane. And to have MJF come back, and face someone like this at a pay-per-view at Forbidden Door. I think it's going to be a tall task for both Hechicero and MJF in this matchup at Forbidden Door, so I'm definitely looking forward to that. And hats off to MJF for getting the win in that matchup. Moving on from that, we have Will Ospreay and Swerve having a face-to-face, -face, pretty much hyping up their match at Forbidden Door. Ospreay and Swerve grab a microphone. Ospreay tells Swerve that he has held titles all around the world and has held multiple titles at the same time. Swerve then interrupts Osprey by saying that Swerve is the best wrestler in the world. Osprey then talks about his accolades and what he's done in professional wrestling, especially what he's done within the ring ropes of AEW, having matches with Kenny Omega and Chris Jericho, as well as Takeshita, which were, I mean, barn burner matches. Osprey then also mocks Swerve by saying that Swerve at one time had a hit row, but Osprey has a hit list, which I thought that was absolutely awesome with Osprey saying that and kind of mocking Swerve. Swerve then talks about his sacrifices and what he's done in his career up to this point and the sacrifices that he has made and the chances that he took to become the uh, become an AEW World Heavyweight Champion. So, you know, and obviously he's made a lot of sacrifices. I'm not taking anything away from Swerve. I think Swerve's done a hell of a job defending that AEW World title. 
Prince Nana then interrupts both Swerve and Osprey by hyping up the Forbidden Door. Swerve then asks Osprey is that what if he takes it personal and then Swerve mentions Osprey's family and then Osprey gets face to face with Swerve. I'm going to be honest with y'all, man. This this match, and I, I stated this a couple weeks back when this match was announced, that I thought this match was booked way too soon. Do I still have that same belief? Yes, I do. Uh, Osprey hasn't even defended the international title, from what I understand. Hasn't inter you know defended that title yet at a pay-per-view or anything else like that. So to me, Osprey really hasn't done a whole lot with the international title. Now, he's done title eliminator matchups and stuff like that, but he hasn't really done a whole lot with that title. That's the reason why I think this matchup was booked way too soon. But I will say this. The promo between Swerve and Osprey, that segment last night, was awesome. From both Osprey and Swerve. I mean, they are selling this match like sliced bread, man. This match between Swerve and Osprey is going to be absolutely insane. And it's going to tear the house down in Forbidden Door. I mean, these guys are no joke. And it's going to be a tall task for both Osprey and Swerve, man. It's going to be one of those things where it's going to be hard to predict who's going to walk out with at Forbidden Door. You know... At one hand, Swerve, you know, can he afford to take a loss and lose the belt? Or can Osprey afford to take a loss? Or does Osprey walk out with two belts? I mean, this is, you know, to see Osprey walk out with the international title in AEW World Championship is a big deal, not only for Will Osprey, but for AEW, because that's never been done since AEW has been in existence where they had, you know, a superstar hold two belts that AEW currently has. We obviously had Eddie Kingston hold the Ring of Honor. And the New Japan Strong Championship, but that is also, you know, New Japan owns that belt, and Ring of Honor is not AEW. So this could be a big deal, not only for Will Ospreay, but for AEW, if Ospreay does happen to beat Swerve and then walks out, not only international champion, but also AEW world champion at the same time. So I'm definitely looking forward to that match, and definitely looking forward to Forbidden Door. Uh, moving on from that, we have an eight-man tag team matchup. It is Zack Sabre Jr. teaming up with Dikesha. Kyle Fletcher and Roderick Strong versus Mark Briscoe, Kyle O'Reilly, Dante Martin, and Orange Cassidy. I thought it was a good match, man. It was a back-and-forth matchup between both teams with Briscoe, O'Reilly, Martin, and Cassidy keeping the pace of the match. Dikesha then hits a powerbomb on Martin off the top rope that looked absolutely brutal. Briscoe then hits a froggy bow at the top rope. Orange then hits a stun dog millionaire. Briscoe then hits a blockbuster off the apron to the outside. And then Orange hits an orange punch on Roderick Strong, pins him for the three, and your winners of the match are Mark Briscoe, Kyle O'Reilly, Dante Martin, and Orange Cassidy. Hats off to them for getting the win in this matchup. Moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It is a title eliminator matchup. It is the Young Bucks versus the Acclaimed. I thought this was a good match, man. It was a back and forth matchup. I know the funny thing about this matchup is when, you know, the Acclaimed come out to the ring, and usually Mac, Max Caster grabs a microphone, does his thing or whatever, but he was interrupted, his microphone was cut off, and then you see Okada on a Titantron controlling the microphone and all that and the volume and stuff like that and controlling, you know, being in the uh, gorilla position. And it was just funny as hell to see Okada back there pretty much mocking the acclaim and stuff like that. So that was definitely hilarious to see that from Okada. But uh, the match itself, it was a decent match, man. It was a good match. It was a back-and-forth matchup between the Young Bucks and the Acclaimed with the Acclaimed keeping the pace throughout the match. Uh, the Young Bucks hit an EVP trigger for a near fall. Nick then goes to hit Bowens with the title, but missed and hit Matt Jackson. And then Max capitalizes on this by hitting a mic drop, pins for the three, and your winners of the match are the Acclaim. The Acclaim get the victory over the Young Bucks, and they will now have the opportunity to challenge the Young Bucks for the AEW Tag Team titles. Hats off to the Acclaim for getting the win in this matchup. Moving on from that, we have a contract signing. It's a contract signing between the current AEW World Champion, Tony Storm, and Shirokawa. Um, I thought this was great, man. The fans are really behind Shirokawa. Shirokawa mocks Tony Storm. She also says that Tony Storm, after she has won that belt, she has become soft. Tony and Shirokawa then both signed the contract. Then Soraya comes down to the ring with the help of Anna J. Anna J then attacks Shirokawa in the ring. Soraya then attacks Mariah May. And then Tony Storm, Tony Storm stops the attack with Soraya and Mariah May. Uh, a couple of things I'm going to say about this, man. This match between Shirakawa and Tony Storm is going to be, I think, really good. I don't know much about Shirakawa, but I do know a lot about Tony Storm. And Tony Storm, with the, the character and what she's done with that world title, she's done a fantastic job, uh, hands down. She is carrying that women's division on her back, hands down. Way more than Mercedes Monet. And you got to give credit where credit's due. Tony Storm is carrying that women's division on her back. 
Now, with that being said, this is going to be an interesting matchup between Shirakawa and Tony Storm for one simple factor, and that is going to be Mariah May. What is Mariah May going to do in this matchup? Because according to Shirakawa, she did tell Mariah May that she would have to choose between herself, Shirakawa, or Tony Storm. To me, I think Tony uh, Mariah May is going to have a lot of involvement in this matchup at Forbidden Door between Tony Storm and Shirakawa. And the biggest question is, is what side is she going to side with? Is it going to be Shirakawa or is she going to be siding with Tony Storm? And I told you guys before, a, a while back, when Mariah May came into AEW, this storyline here, a little bit between Tony Storm and Mariah May, has a lot of similarities here between what we got a long time ago with WWE with Trish Stratus and Mickey James. And I feel like this is going to be the kind of same dynamic that we're going to get here between Tony Storm and Mariah May, where eventually Mariah May will, you know, blossom into her own and then eventually challenge Tony Storm, possibly for the AEW Women's Championship. Now, my prediction is that Tony Storm will walk out with the AEW World Title and beat Shirakawa at Forbidden Door. But, but that being said, I still believe that this matchup between Storm and Shirakawa should be a really good match and an interesting match, like I said, to kind of see where Mariah May sides with, whether it's Shirakawa or Tony Storm. Uh, moving on from that, I have the Owen Hart Cup Tournament bracket announcement for the men. These are the men that are involved in the Owen Hart Cup Tournament this year and the matches that are in the Owen Hart Cup Tournament. So with that being said, we have Claudio versus Pac, which that will take place in the main event, obviously, of Dynamite last night. We have Brian Danielson versus Shingo Takagi. That's going to be a fantastic matchup and a matchup I'm definitely looking forward to. And then we have Ray Phoenix versus Jay White. Again, solid matchup. And then we have Jeff Jarrett versus a wild card. <clears throat> now, to me, the wild card thing kind of stuck out a lot with me, not just because it's Jeff Jarrett. Do I think Jeff Jarrett does, belongs in the tournament? No. I don't. But I will say this. This will be a perfect opportunity for someone to return, possibly slot in MJF into this tournament. Who knows? I know you know a lot of people are like, oh, it could be Ricochet. It could be Ricochet. I think that we need to pump our brakes on that a little bit. We don't know what's going on with Ricochet right now. And for all intents and purposes, he probably he could have already re-signed with WWE. So let's pump the brakes a little bit and, and, and pause with the Ricochet shit because we don't know that's going to happen. But with that being said, it does bring intrigue, intrigue to the Owen Hart Cup tournament. And I told you guys this before when this, this tournament was announced. This tournament's already going to be intriguing due to the fact of what they get in the finals for both men or the women. The men or the women, whoever make the finals, get an opportunity, or at least win the tournament, get an opportunity at All In to go after their their championships. Whether, it, you know, for the women, it could be they're going after the AEW Women's title. And for the men, obviously, they're going for the AEW World title. So this is a big deal. Uh, and one of those things where a lot of people are going to have the eyeballs on for AEW as far as this Owen Hart Cup tournament. So I'm definitely excited for that. Uh, moving on from that, speaking of the Owen Hart Cup Tournament, we go into our first quarterfinal matchup for the women's bracket for the Owen Hart Cup Tournament. It is Nyla Rose versus Chris Statlander. Um, I thought this was a good match, man. It was a back-and-forth matchup between Nyla Rose and Statlander with Statlander keeping the pace of the match. And Statlander ultimately hits a tombstone pile driver on Nyla Rose, pins her for the three, and your winner of the match and moving on in the Owen Hart Cup Tournament is Chris Statlander. Hats off to Statlander for getting the win in that matchup. After that, the Owen Hart Cup tournament for the women's bracket was announced, and those matches are as followed. It is going to be Willow Nightingale versus Serena Deeb, uh, Nyla Rose versus Statlander, which I just talked about, and Statlander beat Nyla Rose, so she moves on the tournament. Uh, we have De uh, Deanna Perrazzo versus Hikaru Shida. Shida will return and, and face off with Perrazzo. And then the final matchup in the Owen Hart Cup tournament for the women is Mariah May versus Soraya. So again, these tournaments, the matchups for the tournaments are going to be absolutely insane for both men and the women. And I definitely look forward to who's going to make it to the finals in both of these respected tournaments. Uh, moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. This is pretty much a glorified squash match. It is Danny Garcia versus Rhett Titus. Um, like I said, okay matchup, glorified squash. Uh, Danny Garcia was keeping the pace throughout the entire match with Garcia hitting the finish on Rhett Titus. Pins for the three, and your winner of the match is Danny Garcia. After the match, the Gates of Agony come down to the ring to attack Matt Menard and Garcia. MJF comes down to the ring. He attacks the Gates of Agony, but Hechicero attacks MJF. Osprey comes down to the ring. Osprey then saves MJF, and Osprey and MJF have a face-to-face. -face. <clears throat> now, a couple things about this, man. This was a great moment. To see Osprey in the ring face-to-face -face with MJF was a great moment. And I think that was one of the biggest things from Dynamite last night and why Dynamite actually was a really good Dynamite last night is because 
the continuing storylines and building storylines last night, which was great, and to see Osprey in the ring with MJF and how important MJF is to AEW and to see Osprey there with MJF face to face kind of tells a story, man. Are we going to possibly get MJF versus Osprey in the foreseeable future? Who knows? But again, it was a great moment, and Osprey came down to save MJF from the gates of agony. Moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It is the main event of Dynamite. It is a Owen Hart Cup quarterfinal matchup for the men. It is Pac versus Claudio Castanoli. I thought it was a great match, man. It was a back-and-forth matchup between Pac and Castanoli, with Castanoli keeping the pace of the match. Castanoli then hits a giant swing on Pac, but Pac ultimately hits a roll-up on Claudio Castanoli, pins him for the three, and your winner of the match and moving on in the Owen Hart Cup tournament is Pac. Hats off to Pac for getting the win in this matchup. A couple things I want to talk about quickly, man, before I get out of here today. Number one, Dynamite last night. Was it a solid show? Yeah. It was definitely one of probably the best Dynamite we've seen in the past couple weeks, in my opinion. Uh, continuing storylines, the build towards Forbidden Door has been great, to be honest with you. I'm definitely looking forward to the Forbidden Door. The build's been great. The storylines have been great. The Osprey and Swerve segment that happened last night, absolutely awesome. Definitely excited for that matchup and to see who walks out with the AEW World title. Um, but this is something that AEW, and I stressed this a lot last week when I was talking about this, was that you know AEW, I think people, including myself, need to come to the realization that I think AEW is not going to be a company that's going to build and build upon storylines for those match for a lot of matches. I don't think it's going to happen. They don't have what WWE has right now. And I'll give you guys a prime example. You know, just this past Monday night, I did tune in to Raw. I didn't do a review on it, but I tuned in. And the main reason why I tuned in is because there was a lot of speculation around the return of Uncle Howdy and, you know, the Wyatt family. And that did happen. It did. You know, we got to see Uncle Howdy and Nikki Cross, and the presentation was incredible. Uh, you know, incredible. But they continue the storyline. That's what, and that's what I mean by continuing storylines. I mean, we haven't seen Uncle Howdy with, you know, attached to Bray Wyatt until I think it was Bray Wyatt and Eli, uh, LA Knight. And that was a while ago, you know. So to continue that storyline and, and continue that you know, basically story that, you know, Bray Wyatt created from the very beginning, you know, with the Fiend character and everything else, everything else like that, and continuously keep building off of that. It was just fantastic. And th that wasn't even the final product. I know a lot of people are like, well, I don't know where they're going to go with the Wyatt family and Uncle Howdy, but that's something where as fans, you really got to sink your teeth in and just wait and see what happens. Because I can tell you right now, I saw that presentation that, you know, the new Wyatt family had with Uncle Howdy and stuff like that, and it was absolutely fantastic. So, you know, you're, you're going to want to tune in every Monday night or every, you know, every Friday night to see what the hell happens with the Wyatt family. I know SmackDown, everybody's going to be watching SmackDown because we get the return possibly of CM Punk. You know, WWE right now are firing on all cylinders, not counting NXT. I know NXT is kind of, you know, we're going to see where it goes. I told you guys that I covered Battleground, and I was kind of like, I don't know where it's going to go with NXT, but then they just had this big Battle Royal, and then you get the likes of some uh, TNA talent, especially Joe Hendry. And everybody lost their mind when Joe Hendry showed up at this Battle Royal. So obviously there's something going on there between NXT and TNA, which is great for both companies. I never said it was a bad thing for both NXT or TNA. Uh, but it just wasn't my cup of tea. But with that being said, you know, with AEW, I don't think we're going to get that with AEW and this continuous storyline. Because prime example, you know, we, I, I mentioned this last week. When you look at the storyline here between Tony Khan and the Elite, I feel like it's kind of come to a stalemate, man, because we don't know really what the hell is going on here and what what is going to be the ultimate end game. And I feel like, unfortunately, you know, AEW and the Elite, they're going to box themselves into a corner, and this storyline, when it comes to an end, it's going to be possibly complete shit. And no one's really going to give a damn because at this point, the wells run dry, man. I mean, I don't think how I mean, I can't really. I've, I've talked to my friends about this, and they're like, well, how much investment can I really have in this storyline when. It went from, a you know, the anarchy in the arena and then, you know, obviously the the elite beat team AEW and now it's nothing. We don't see, you know, Tony Khan. All we're getting is a mouthpiece from Tony Khan, which being Christopher Daniels, which we did not see really last night. So we don't know where this is going with, you know, the elite and Tony Khan. And I gave my predictions of what I think should happen if I was fantasy booking this storyline would be the fact that Tony Khan and AEW, you know, both these entities are too big to be on one show and we could see Tony Khan running the AEW uh, Dynamite, and then Young Bucks and the Elite running Collision, 
and we have a draft and everything else like that, and there's two separate entities running these shows that are under the AEW umbrella because we're honestly right now AEW Collision needs this. You know, and I think it would benefit both parties for the you know AEW to do this because AEW I still believe needs to hit the reset button. <clears throat> in my honest opinion, and I'm not saying that AEW's you know going downhill or a shit company. <clears throat> That's not what I'm saying, but I think at the end of the day. You know, as fans, and I'm putting myself in that too because I am a fan, we need to realize as fans that we can't compare that to WWE. And we can't compare WWE to AEW. It's just the way it is. It's not tribalism, it's just the, the nature of the beast. WWE has been a force to be reckoned with for many, many decades. Where AEW is a startup company that's been around for maybe four or five years. And yeah, there is some finger pointing, you know, between WWE and AEW. And I get that. And there's obviously tribalism. I don't have any tribalism. I told you guys before, I just don't cover WWE, Raw, and SmackDown right now because it doesn't fit in my current schedule. But, not sitting here saying that the product is complete shit. Right now, WWE is firing on all cylinders. If you're a wrestling fan right now, and you're saying that WWE and their product is shit, you're not a wrestling fan. You're not. You're basically there just to complain and, and whine about the company for no apparent reason. Only solely because probably that there is tribalism with that individual and because they're, you know, either Team WWE or Team AEW. I'm neutral, bro. I'm Switzerland. I, I, I want both companies to prosper and succeed. You know, but do I think right now, currently, AEW is right there neck and neck with WWE? Absolutely not. No, I can't say that. WWE right now is firing on all cylinders and AEW is taking a humongous backseat. You know, with obviously them having more global P uh, PLEs, you know, they just went to Glasgow, Scotland for Clash of the Castle. I mean, you know, they just had, a, you know, NXT had an uh, event at the UFC Apex Center. WWE knows what they're doing, and the, the juggernaut that's running that right now is Triple H. Triple H knows what the hell he's doing. And Tony, if I was Tony Khan, you know, I, I'd, I'd realize that quick. You're not going to go up against a guy like Paul Levesque. It's just, it's not going to happen. Not with the resources that they have, the roster that they have. Not taking anything away from the current AEW roster. It's just, Tony Khan doesn't know how to build storylines that get you intrigued. Now, at one point, AEW was doing that in the very beginning. And I, I mentioned this multiple times in the past, too. The first two and a half, maybe three years tops with AEW, they were firing on all cylinders. The storylines were there. They got people invested, everything else like that. But as of late, I feel as if Tony Khan and AEW, they got lazy. They got lazy. And, and, and it's, it's showing. I'm not saying last night's Dynamite was bad. If anything, that was the best Dynamite I've seen from AEW in the past, like, two, three weeks, hands down. But that does not mean we're going to get the same shit we got last night next week. You know what I mean? Obviously, everybody's going to be invested because the Owen Hart Cup tournament for both men and women. Yeah, you're going to be invested. You're going to want to tune in because you want to know what the hell's going on. And it gets, you know, eyeballs on the product, which is great. But storyline-wise, I just don't think it's a storyline-based company. It's just not. You know, and that might be a hot take for most people, but the truth is the truth, man. I'm not seeing it. And as far as, like I said earlier, you know, as far as the storyline right now, if you want to call it that, between the Elite and Tony Khan, I feel like it's come to a stalemate, man. Like, what the hell are we doing? Yes, we got the match at Blood and Guts July 24th or July 25th, in ten and I think in Nashville, Tennessee. Great. That's awesome. You know, but we need to start building towards it. I know, you know, there was a lot of people telling me that they're, they're writing Adam Page back into a storyline to bring him back on AEW television. Great. What the hell took so long? Number one, was he injured? You know what I mean? Like, he rode off in the sunset. No one knows what the hell was going on. And two, is it too late? You know what I mean? Is it too late? You know, where's the storyline going to go? And, my, and this is the biggest question. If the Elite happened to beat Team AEW again in Blood and Guts, then where does this go? And vice versa. You know, how, how are you going to book the endgame for this so-called storyline between the Elite and Tony Khan? They can ultimately back themselves in the corner. But with that being said, like I said multiple times now, AEW's Dynamite show last night was great. It was a really good show. I'm not going to say it was the best Dynamite of all time, but it damn sure was not the worst. And they continue storylines and some build towards the Forbidden Door, which that's great. That's awesome. But... Again, that needs to happen every single week and build and build and build and get the fans invested, not only in your product, but invested in these storylines. That way the matches actually give a shit and the fans are invested. That's what AEW and Tony Khan need to do, hands down. You know, And obviously there's talent that's signed to AEW that we haven't seen yet. I know I mentioned a while back ago that I I was told that you know there was talks and contract talks between... AEW and the Mercy Machine Guns. Well, we haven't gotten that yet, and to me, it looks like that's not going to happen. 
And I mentioned the same thing with Camille. I know AEW had signed Camille. Where the hell is she? And my, this is the other thing too. If you have no such direction for these people that you signed to a contract, you have this tournament. Put them in a tournament. It's the same thing with Ricky Starks. Ricky Starks is sitting on the shelf. He's not injured at all. Why can't we put him in a tournament? Take, get the hell rid of Jeff Jarrett's ass. Let him sit home or do whatever the hell he does with you know Jay Lethal and Satnam Singh and all that shit, and slot in Ricky Starks to be a part of this tournament. That way, you don't have to worry about creative direction for him. You put him in the tournament and it writes itself. And then you, that's how you bring Ricky Starks back on television. Done deal. Get the rid of Jeff Jarrett. Je I, honestly, for what it's worth, look, I, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm the biggest Jeff Jarrett hater of all time. But Jarrett doesn't do anything for AEW, to me, that benefits AEW at all. I, I, I'm sorry. I don't. I, I, to me, with all due respect to Jeff Jarrett, you know, and I've watched Jeff Jarrett my entire life wrestling on television, whether it was WWE and WCW. You know, I'm not sitting here saying the guy can't wrestle. But Jarrett, to me, it's just like, Christ, man, even his WCW run was, it was shit. I, I'm sorry. If we're going to, you know, you know, especially with this documentary coming out with, you know, who killed WCW, let's talk about it for a second. When it pertains to Jeff Jarrett, what the hell did Jarrett do in WCW? Yeah, he was World Heavyweight Champion. At a time that the company was absolute shit. Where, well, Jarrett was with the company for a while, so where was Jarrett then? Hmm? They had no one else to put the title on but Jeff Jarrett. Let, let's, let's keep it a stack. Let's keep it real. What the hell did Jarrett do in his career? It's like, oh my God, yeah, Jeff Jarrett's the man. No. His early WWF run in Attitude Era was trash. It was trash. Not only that, he was riding the coattails of Ric Flair with the strut and the figure four. Let's keep it real. The man can't even come up with his own shit that's original. Jeff Jarrett's best run that he's had in his entire career, only solely because he was a part owner, I believe, of the company, or at least the one of the bookers, was TNA. That was Jeff Jarrett's end-all, be-all in his career was TNA. And he was working exclusively with, with Dixie Carter during that time that he was also being a booker and wrestling on TNA television. That was the best part of, of Jeff Jarrett's career, hands down. That's why when I looked at the tournament, I saw Jeff Jarrett. I'm like, why are we getting this? Why? To stay relevant for what? For what? If you're a Jeff Jarrett fan, I'm sorry. I, I truly am. But the, 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 that it's done. Jarrett's done. He needs to be backstage in a backstage role. Period. End. Is the guy a decent wrestler? Yes. But the truth is the truth. His WCW year run was shit. The reason why he was World Heavyweight Champion at that time is because WCW had no direction at that time. And come to find out, what was it, a year or two later, they closed up shop and were bought out by Vince McMahon. They had no, they had no damn direction at all. That's the God honest truth. They had no direction. So let's let's put the, let's put the strap and put the belt on Jeff Jarrett. That's why he became World Heavyweight Champion. It's, it's, I'm going to keep it a buck with y'all. So to me, Jared, it, it just—it was one of those things where as soon as I saw his name, I'm like, "You got to be kidding me, man!" No. And people are like, "Oh, he was friends with Owen." Yeah, I get that. I get that. But there's a lot of other people that he, that could have that slot. That's not Jeff Jared. To be honest with you, I'm sorry. Make the make the tournament predominant names in the company. What the hell has Jeff Jared done in AEW that's actually worth a damn? Seriously. As even as a Jeff Jarrett fan, what can you say in AEW that he's done it was like holy shit, man, that Jeff Jarrett really, you know, he's doing big, big shit over there in AEW. No, he's not. He's not. And if we're gonna compare apples to oranges, look at Jarrett when he come in and look at a guy like Adam Copeland. Copeland has done a fantastic job since he's he came into AEW. What the hell has Jarrett done? Nothing. Nothing. That's even worth a damn. Nothing. No predominant storylines. I mean, for Christ's sake, man, you look at a guy like Jay, Le Jay Lethal, who was, you know, former Ring of Honor world champion, and they're not doing shit with Lethal. Lethal needs to get the hell away from Jarrett, to be honest with you. That whole Jarrett Satnam Singh deal, that's bringing Lethal down, to be honest with you. Lethal should be competing for international titles, TNT championships, you know, FTW championships, so on and so forth. 
Ain't doing that with the baggage that he has with Satnam Singh and, and Jeff Jarrett. Just not happening. Jeff Jarrett doesn't need to be in a tournament, man. Jeff Jarrett needs to stay his ass in the back and not be on television. I'm sorry. That's the one that's the one negative takeaway I take away from Dynamite last night was the announcement of Jeff Jarrett being in that damn tournament. Doesn't need to happen. It doesn't. You know, I can live my, the rest of my life not seeing Jared wrestle in the ring. You know, I commend what his father's done. I, I, I've mentioned that before. What Jerry Jarrett did and the promotions that he ran back in the day did a fantastic job. Absolutely. But with all due respect to Jerry Jarrett, Jeff Jarrett ain't no Jerry Jarrett. He ain't running his own promotion. And even when he did, they went bankrupt with Global Force. And yeah, they're coming back. But what happened then compared to now? I'm just keeping it a buck, man. I, I, I'm just I'm tired of this whole shit where AEW has this roster, and then you have people that are on the damn roster, you know, being honest and telling people the truth. The fact that the, you know these people are sitting at home looking for looking for work. Take Jared's ass out and put Ricky Starks in. Now I'm not saying that there could be a chance where the mystery person is Ricky Starks. I'm not saying that it couldn't be, but I'm just saying Jeff Jarrett. Why? Why? does nothing. It does absolutely nothing. And like I said, if you're a Jarrett fan, God bless you. I'm not saying, like I said, I'm not saying Jarrett can't wrestle. I'm not saying that. But there's nothing that in AEW that he's done to slot him into this damn tournament. That's my biggest thing. And you look at the names that are in this tournament. These guys are still active in what they're doing in professional wrestling. Whether it's Shingo Takagi, Brian Danielson, um, Jay White, Ray Phoenix, hell, Ray Phoenix just had a damn match with probably the best wrestler on the planet with Will Ospreay for the international title. Again, what the hell has Jarrett done? Nothing. Nothing. That's the shit that pisses me off with AEW. And it's not completely Jarrett's fault. I'm not saying it's, you know, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge Jeff, Jader, uh, Jeff Jarrett hater. No, I'm not saying that. But what has he done to get him an opportunity at the Owen Hart Cup, tour, uh, Owen Cup tournament? And not only that, possibly have the chance to win it, and get an AEW World Title shot. That'll be one of the biggest mistakes AEW has ever done. That's that, I'm, and again. I'm just being serious with y'all, man. I'm just keeping it, keeping it a stack. Jaren ain't done shit. He ain't done shit. And to be honest with you, he doesn't need to be in a tournament. It's that simple. That's the only negative I could say about AEW Dynamite last night. Other than that, it was a great night. It's a great night. But AEW needs to build storylines. Continue to build storylines like they did last night. Leading up to these pay-per-views or in, in their weekly episodic television. And then it, it's done deal. It's a done deal. It's not hard to understand or not hard to it's not hard to comprehend. It's not. Continuation of storylines that lead to the final product, which is the match that we're going to get at such and such pay-per-view. That's what you get, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Hell, I wouldn't even have the world champion defend their belt on weekly, uh, on weekly television. I would have it only at pay-per-views. And build the storylines up between the world champion, whether it's Swerve or Osprey, against somebody else, and build that storyline. <clears throat> to be honest with you, hell, I wouldn't have had their world champion even lose on their weekly episodic television until we get to the pay per view. And build that storyline, heel babyface, not hard to comprehend. But other than that, I mean, it is what it is, man. I'm not. People could say that I'm I'm a Jared hater. I'm not a Jared hater. I just it doesn't make sense for him to be in the goddamn tournament. That's the that's to me the biggest thing. It's not. There's other names and other people that are involved with AEW that could have been slotted in this tournament, and it would have been the best tournament of all time. You know, could have been a Malachi Black. It could have been, I don't know what Darby Allen's doing or whether he's still taking some time off. Who knows? You know, John. Mo well, I know John Moxley's obviously a part of the matchup against Naito um, for the IWGP uh, World Heavyweight Championship. But to me, I mean, Ricky Starks. Again, Ricky Starks could be that mystery person. I don't know. I know some people said, oh, it could be Ricochet. Like I told you all before, man, let's pump our brakes on that. We don't know what's going on with Ricochet right now. But with that being said, I mean, you know, it's going to still be musty TV, but I just don't think Jared deserves to be in that tournament. I don't. I'm sorry. I, that's just my opinion. He ain't done anything to warrant himself a opportunity even for a title shot, or to be in this damn tournament. Hands down. Hands down. Um, but with that being said, this is my review of AEW's Dynamite. I hope you guys are out there staying safe. Be careful.